Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to Living the Dream with Curveball, a podcast where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by a special guest. She is none other than Milagros Phillips. Milagros is an author, speaker, and racial equity coach. Milagros has been creating programs for racial healing for more than 30 years. She is the creator of Race Demystified, and she does this work because she knows that she has a special voice to add. So Milagros, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so happy to be here with you, Curtis. Thank you for inviting me. Well, why don't you start off by giving everybody a little bit of background about yourself? Sure, absolutely. So I was born and pretty much raised when I was 10, when I came to live in New York City, in the Dominican Republic where there's a lot of colorism. And so for from as young as three, four years old, I already knew that I was black, that there were opportunities that would not be allotted to me because of that. And that, you know, that there was a, a kind of a, a, an unspoken thing in my family where my mother had this, it, it was kind of like this, this personal code that she was going to raise her girls to be self-sufficient. So they never had to work in someone's home because when you're a dark skinned Dominican at that point, I I was born in the uh, mid fifties that, you know, you were raised to be a domestic for the most part. And so uh, my mother's thing was that none of her girls would ever work in anyone's home. And she was going to keep her boys out of jail. Like that was her big you know, her, her, her big thing in life. And um, which, you know, she was hugely successful at that. Um, but, you know, just, just the idea that you have to live your life and raise people with that kind of a background, right? She wanted to make sure everybody was educated and, and everyone knew, um, you know, how to take care of themselves in life. But in 1965, in the, well, 1964 was when my father made sure that we were all out of the DR Um, and had, you know, brought, make sure that everyone was in the U.S. He was still back in the Dominican Republic because he he was running a company there. But my father knew that there was a war coming. A lot of people don't know that the reason you have so many Dominicans living in New York that came to this country in the late 60s and, and beyond was because the U.S. went to war with the Dominican Republic. And a lot of people don't know that. So I came to the U.S. and experienced pretty much the same levels, of, if not much deeper levels of racism um, in New York um, that I had experienced back there. And so, I, you know, I always tell people that I, I kind of got my calling the day that Dr. King died. We had been in the country for about three years and my father and I were watching television. My mother had gone to the store. And they announced that Dr. King had been shot. And then they came back on television again and announced that he had died. And I remember I I walked out of the living room, went in the bathroom and shut the door. And I just started bawling. Like I just couldn't stop crying. And I remember hearing, like I literally heard a voice that said, you're to continue the work. I had no idea what that meant. But here's what I did know. I knew somebody just killed that man for doing that. So there's no way. I'm 13 years old. I'm not touching it, right? But years went by, and eventually I became a diversity consultant. But I found that that meant for me that I needed to have conversations on race. And so somehow I would always end up in a conversation in organizations talking about race. So eventually I started to create my own programs because, you know, back then nobody was talking about raising organizations. It was all diversity, right? 
And so I created programs to bring awareness to that. And since then, I've written four books. My fourth book will be out this month, August of 2021. And it's called Cracking the Healer's Code, a Prescription for Healing Racism and Finding Wholeness. Because what I found was that when it comes to race and racism, we all need healing. We're not educated to be race literate, so we don't even know what we're really dealing with, the historical context, the international laws that we're all still under, and the impact on, of all of that on our daily lives. And so, um, so yeah, so I just, you know, I started doing the work, and, and I never could have imagined to find such peace and fulfillment doing this kind of work because it's the kind of work that transforms not only your life but the life of the people around you the way that organizations think about themselves and about their employees the things that they do and do not for their employees and even the ways in which we think about inclusion so it just really helps to 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 get people to think differently. Like Einstein said, you can't solve your problems with the same consciousness that created it. So we have to think differently about this stuff. And one of the things that we need in order to be able to think differently is the context, knowing the history around some of this stuff, because we literally do not learn it in school. You call yourself a racial equity coach. Explain what that means. Sure. Yeah. So one of the things that I do is I work directly with organizational leaders to help them understand racial equity and to understand the business case for racial racial equity, because you always got to bring it down to the dollars. Right. And um, and to help them really know how to be truly be allies to these racial equity programs that they have in their organizations, how to be a leader around those programs, because so many times leaders just, they kind of stay out of the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation. Some leaders think they're above it, you know, because they think like, you know, I'm the leader of the organization. So obviously, you know, I don't have to go to these programs, but in reality you do, (laughs) because this is a poison that, that, has, you know, run through the entire human culture. And it's 500, more than almost 600 years worth of um, institutionalized dysfunction around this stuff. And so we've all been badly educated around it. And it's important for all of us to get as much information as we can if we're ever going to make the transformation to a more equitable world and a world that recognizes that we're one human family. And we live on one planet and we need to figure this stuff out. (laughs) Talk about some of the programs that you have created for racial healing to kind of help deal with the situation. Sure. Yeah. So I have a program called Race Literacy 101. And it's a program that I offer organizations. It's only an hour and a half, but it gives people some serious context around this stuff. So for instance, Most people, most of us don't know simply because, again, we haven't been told, right? We don't know that how how all of this racial stuff got started, you know, how this stuff was started in the 1400s in Europe with something called the papal bull from from the 1450s that was revised several times. And after Columbus went back to Europe after landing in Quisqueya, which is the original name of that the natives, the Tainos had given to that island and claiming it La Española for Spain and is now currently the Dominican Republic. When he went back to Spain in 1493, he took with him gold, silver, food, which, you know, a lot of Europe, they got three months to grow their food. So, you know, food was kind of scarce over there and a lot of poverty and, 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 uh, and diseases and stuff. And so he brought all this stuff back and, and, all of these monarchies, which were all related, were like, oh my gosh, we've got to go colonize these places. And so, um, you know, and they had already been doing, they had been colonizing the coast of Africa for years because the papacy had created something called the papal bull, which is called the doctrine of discovery that allowed for the, the prince, he was known as, as uh, Henry the Navigator, the prince of Portugal 
to colonize all of the, the West Coast of Africa. And he, in, in this papal bull basically said that he could kill, vanquish, uh, take the, the property of the people that were there and enslave them for perpetuity. And this, this law called a papal bull, which still exists in the Vatican and is still ruling countries that were colonized by Europeans, including the United States, is, is, uh, is something that a lot of people don't know about. And it was really the beginning of that. That's really what helped to start the um, transatlantic slave trade. And the first enslaved Africans that were taken from the continent and brought to this part of, of the world uh, in 1509 were Africans that were taken to the Dominican Republic to work in the sugarcane plantations and to, um, to also uh, farm cotton. And, and again, a lot of history that people don't know. And so, you know, so people need to be educated about th those kinds of things. So I have a program called Race Literacy 101, in which I give people the historical context of the stuff that we're dealing with, because that papal bull, people could say, oh, it was 1493. That was a long time ago. Well, you know, yeah, it was a long time ago. We're still using it. The last time that the papal bull, uh, the doctrine of discovery was used was in 2005 when Justice Ginsburg used it in the Supreme Court to win a case against the Oneida Nation in New York. It's been used in 2015. It's been used in Australia, in Canada, in New Zealand. And there are over 5,000 cases in which the doctrine of discovery has been used in the continental USA. And, and the thing to import, to, that's important to remember about that piece of history is that not only is it still with us today, but um, Native Americans have been trying to get the Vatican to rescind it because it is international law. But here's the thing, that law was not just about the land. And I know that the natives are fighting to get some of their land back and, and, and so they want to rescind this, but it's so much deeper than that. Because what the doctrine of discovery says is that Europeans could go in and vanquish and take the property, take the land, take everything, including personal property, and enslave the people for perpetuity because they were, they were not Catholic, not just Christian. They weren't specifically Catholic. And so, you know, so this piece of law is not just about the land. It's about the land the waterways, and the people. And so when you start to break that down and you start to look at how difficult it is for us as Black people to get a loan to buy a house or how difficult it is for us as people of color to buy land, um, all those kinds of, they're all related to the doctrine of discovery. But if we don't know that, we can't ask for it to be rescinded and we can't do what we need to do so that we can rise above it. So, so context is extremely important. So my programs are all based on history, science, research, and storytelling to give people a holistic view of this stuff, a view that helps them to understand how this has affected us in mind, body, spirit, and emotions, and how it affects our actions, reactions, and interactions, and how all of us, all of us have absorbed that caste system that was set up by the Spaniards based on the Indian system, but different from that, that was set up very early on when they first started to land in um, Dominican, what is now Dominican Republic, IT, Haiti, the other side of Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and so on. And all of these countries are still experiencing the aftermath of this almost 600 years of colonization. And while it's taken on a different form, it still exists today. So give us a brief description of your books and also kind of tell us about the new book that's coming out. Sure. Yeah. So the first book I wrote is called um, 11 Reasons to Become Race Literate. And I wrote that book so that anyone regardless of the color of their skin, can pick up that book and just get 
in, you know, little bits of information that will spark something in them and lead them to do further research. And even if you have a teenage child, you can you can assign them one of the chapters to do a whole book report on that, just that. So I wrote that. And then I realized, well, you know, people are going to read this book and then they're going to have conversations around the 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 cooler at work, right? That this was back when we were in office. This back in 2016 is when I wrote it, and I, I thought to myself, you know, those the race conversation very quickly turns sour, and and people start arguing, and it's about it, it ends up being a competition about who's right and who's wrong. And I thought that I don't want my books to do that. So I wrote a second book called Eight Essentials to a Race Conversation, and Eight Essentials to a Race Conversation walks people through you know, how to prepare for the conversation, what those conversations can be that so that anyone can not just hold a really good, healthy conversation on race, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, but also can lead groups in conversations. And there's actually a manual in the back of the book that even gives people, you know, like some of the um, things that, that they should put out there up front so that people will know these are the rules that we're going to follow to have this conversation, right? My third book is Speaking Race in Healthcare. And I wrote that book because I just really kind of got sick and tired of hearing people in, in the media and on the news constantly talking about how Black folks have higher incidence of diabetes, high blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. And no one's talking about the fact that those are stress-related illnesses and that Black folks, we walk around with intergenerational historical trauma that has never been healed. We walk around with the micro and macro aggressions that we experience on a regular basis, how we've never healed our own Stockholm syndrome from being kidnapped hundreds of years ago and it's never been healed. How you know, like there's all this stuff that we carry literally in our bones because we know through epigenetics that trauma gets passed on until you actually do something to heal it, right? And, you know, when they set the slaves free, I don't care where they set us free, whether it was the Dominican Republic, the US, Panama, you know, nobody gave us a little pink paper and said, go see your psychiatrist, you're gonna need it. You know what I mean? Like that just did not happen. And so what has happened is that we keep passing on the trauma and we've normalized the dysfunction in such a way that we no longer recognize it as a dysfunction. We just think, oh, that's just what we do. You know, when in reality, when you educate people, they realize, oh, that's what I do because that's how I was traumatized. But I can do differently and I can do better. And once people start to get that, it changes their lives. It changes the way they treat their families. It allows them to have more compassion for even the people who had once enslaved them. The other day I got something that was, was just coming out of the shower and I got this thought hit me that the greatest form of love is to be self-liberating and then turn around and liberate your enslaver. We have an opportunity to transform the world in ways that it has never been transformed before, but people need the truth. They need to be able to have good information so that they can make that transformation. My fourth book is called Cracking the Healer's Code, a prescription for healing racism and finding wholeness. And the reason that I wrote that book is because that's the book I started 18 years ago when I first started to do a program, which is now 20 years old. It's a program called Race Demystified. And it's a two-day intensive that takes people through a process of transformation where they never see race the same way again. And in fact, I'm going to do one of those programs tomorrow for two days. It's, it's a um, Wednesday, Thursday program. We just did one this weekend, a Saturday, Sunday program. The, I've been doing that program hugely successfully for two years, uh, for 20 years, and um, have had a few thousand people go through that program. And the people in organizations say, well, we never even interview the same way again, because you get it. And once people get it, you know, when people get good information, they make good decisions for the most part. Yes, there are people out there who will, who just are not going to get it because they don't want to. Okay, they don't want to get it. They they much prefer to remain ignorant. So there are people out there that are like that. It serves them. The ignorance serves them in some form or another. But for the most part, people really do want to do the right thing. But they need good information to do it. And so this this uh, fourth book 
is to give people some of the historical context, some of the information that they need to understand how people develop differently based on where in the world they developed and some of those behaviors that come with that, and then really bringing it forward to what we're looking at today and why we all need to heal. Do you think critical race theory being implemented in schools and people talking about that now is a good thing or a bad thing? Why or why not? Okay, yeah. I, I, I actually think talking about it is a good thing. What I think is bad is the misinformation about it. Critical race theory isn't a thing. It's actually a way of looking at some of the laws that have been, you know, that have been implemented that have kept people trapped in a lot of different ways. Remember, I just talked about doctrine of discovery is actually international law. Okay. And so, um, so critical race theory was developed um, in 1970. And um, I don't know why I'm losing her name. I can see her face, but I'm losing her name. Um, She developed it for, uh, she's a law professor at Columbia University, and she also teaches at a university out in California. She's an African-American woman. And she developed this theory because they needed a way for law students to look at the law. So critical race theory is less a thing then it is a way of looking at and understanding the, the ways in which laws have been written so that they affect people of color in negative ways. So it's like looking at the racism within the laws, okay? They are not teaching that in K through 12. They're not. First of all, <laughs> most people barely understand critical race theory. Okay, and they and what's happened is it's being used as a political thing. It's a catchy phrase. So, you know, but you ask people, well, what is critical race theory? And they can't answer you because they don't know what it is. And they and I can tell you right now <laughs> that they're not teaching it in school because it's complex, number one. And number two, it was written for law, law students. Not all of their about 235, 237 law schools in this country, about 200 of them offer critical race theory as a course, not everybody takes it. I, I, I did a, a TED talk in 2018. And I started my TED talk by saying, who would we be as Americans if along with reading, writing, and arithmetic, we were also raised to be race literate? If they were teaching critical race theory in school, I didn't learn it. My kids didn't learn it. My friends' grandchildren are not learning it. So I don't know where they're teaching it. (laughs) They're not, okay? Critical race theory is something that's being taught in law schools, not in elementary schools, because it's it's a complex thing. Besides your book, you got any upcoming projects that people need to know about? Right now, what my main thing is getting that book in the hands of as many people around the world as possible. They're going to start, I think it's within, before the end of this month, they're going to translate that book into Spanish. My hope is to get that book translated into all of the colonial languages so that all of the people living in places that have been colonized can get access to the history that we should have had access to hundreds of years ago, but we never got it, you know? And so that's my main thing. I'm also going to be doing Race Demystified, which is that two-day program in the fall. Uh, We're setting it up to do it in early November. And I'm also going to start in September. I'm starting to do what I call lunch and learn programs. We'll be doing those twice a month. And um, the lunch and learn programs are great because you can, it's uh, Mondays at 12 noon Eastern and anyone can attend. I love having educators attend that program because it's important for them to understand how to teach our children. So I'm, I'm hoping that people will join us. I would love to have folks Join my my Instagram and and my uh, Facebook, Milagros Phillips Race Healer. Would absolutely love to have more folks join and become part of the Race Healer family. Do you have a website? So on Instagram and Facebook, it's Milagros Phillips Race Healer. Or you got a yes. website? Yeah, my website is milagrosphillips.com. Perfect. Now, one more question I want to ask before I get some final thoughts before we close it out. 
you t- you mentioned earlier that the U.S. went to war with the Dominican Republic in the 60s and people don't know about it. Can you give us a brief description why that happened? Well, it's um, <laughs> it's the same reason we went to war with Grenada or, you know, um, to be honest with you, I don't understand it. OK, to this day, I still don't understand that war. Um, it's the it's, Dominican Republic is a poor, tiny country. They don't have the firepower, you know, um, as as the big American army. So as a as a child, my parents got me out of there before they told me that there was going to be a war. And it was 1964. Sure enough, there was a war in 1965. My father was brilliant and very astute. So he knew what was coming. But it's it's the same reason that we always go to war. Somebody has something that we want. Well, you know, and and to be honest with you, I haven't done research on that because I just just you know, like I came to the U.S. and then I, I landed here and this has been my country ever since. But and my mother was an American citizen. But, you know, the Dominican Republic still has a lot of gold still to this day. In fact, around four years ago, they found a new vein of gold and the Canadians were trying to take it out of the Dominican Republic. And so I don't know why we went to, why the U.S. went to war with the Dominican Republic, but I'm sure we had something. They had something we wanted. That's always the story. When when, uh, people read my book, they'll understand why I say that. Any final thoughts before we close it out? I'm so thankful, Curtis, that you called and you invited me to your show. I know that um, the work that you're doing is really important, opening doors and giving people the opportunity to tell their stories and to bring greater, a greater sense of knowledge and awareness to our human family. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for having me on your show. I really appreciate you. Many blessings to you. Well, I appreciate you too. And listeners, please be sure to follow, rate, review, share after listening. Android listeners, go to the Google Play Store and download the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast app. Malagros, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Curtis. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.